Hello, I'm Julie Levitt Learson for Fairfield University's Honors Course 1101 5 What We Leave Behind History of Fashion, Architecture, and Decor. And today we're going to be talking about fashion of the 1920s. I'm just going to give you kind of a taste of the decade because I know several of you are working on this era for your final projects, and I do not wish to steal your thunder. And just a reminder about what was going on when the year 1920 rolled around. The world is still recovering from World War I. Europe in particular is reeling both economically and politically. A lot of um, so-called stable 19th century governments have completely collapsed. The U.S. is entering an era of unprecedented prosperity, with the exception of farmers um, and um, people of color who are being disenfranchised under Jim Crow. Um, but for many in America, business is booming, labor unions are gaining strength, um, and in the aftermath of World War I, women in the UK and women in the United States get the right to vote. So we're really in a kind of revolutionary time, both political, economical, social, um, and some would say also a revolution in morality. This all gets mirrored in a revolution in fashion as well. So let's start with women's wear of the 1920s. We, being 100 years past the 1920s now, carry around a lot of misconceptions about women's fashions. We are endlessly fascinated with the Great Gatsby era and the flapper um, and prohibition, um, largely because of some iconic movies, um, mainly from the 1970s and then in the 2010s. But our concept of the 20s flapper girl kind of oversimplifies the aesthetic of the area, of the era. And our memory um, is clouded by kind of more recent takes and retakes on those fashion sensibilities. So let's take a closer look at what was actually worn. As I'm sure you remember from recent lectures, women's foundation garments have been rapidly changing for a few decades now. and We've kind of watched the women's corset slide down her torso for the last couple of decades. Well, we have an even more radical change from even the 1910s and the 19-teens. No more corset. We now have a brassiere, which is sometimes called a bandeau top if it's strapless, and tap pants or knickers. Or if you can see here on the right, um, a camisole and tap pants are kind of sewn into one garment and they're called combinations or step-ins. These are made out of light, lightweight, floaty, whispery fabrics, you know, silk if you can afford it, cotton or other, you know, tried and true undergarment fabrics if you can. But obviously a lot less volume, a lot less tailoring um, and, and heavy shaping and, and kind of forcing the human figure into a fashionable form, but really just kind of covering women's bodies. Um, you can see that the, the bra is compressing the bosom slightly. Um, and we also have girdles that do kind of tend to flatten the tummy. They're usually reinforced with rubber um, or elastic or some other new wonder fabrics of this modern industrial age. And of course, they have garters to help hold up stockings. But compared to all of that corsetry and petticoats and all the other stuff that goes with it, this is like wearing virtually nothing. So in the early 20s, this long rectilinear silhouette kind of is continuing. You can see the skirt hems are mid to lower calf. Um, they're exposing a women's ankle um, and lower leg, but not much else. And then you can see. Um, especially during the daytime, sleeves go down to the elbow. Um, and we have that kind of, like I said, recti rectilinear shape. The woman's body has become a column, again, like we've seen before. Um, the fabric is kind of soft, kind of drapey. The waistline is dropping a little bit. Um, you can see it accentuated with a belt or a band or a gathering at the waist. And there are lots of very simple, um, bits of contrast and trim kind of affixed to. So we're kind of turning back again to that Greek ketan look in some ways. And in these images, the one on the right, these are probably cotton dresses for day wear for women that are doing chores around the house, um, you know, maybe entertaining close friends over. And then on the left hand side is from the Elite Styles magazine. So um, these are more like for afternoon wear, for visiting, 
for luncheon, for garden party, that kind of social um, event. And so here are some surviving day dresses from the early 1920s, 1920, 1921, thereabouts. Um, the one on the right is definitely cotton. The one on the left may be cotton, maybe silk. As you can see, they're very lightweight fabrics. They're just kind of floaty. There's not a whole lot of extra volume in them. There's a little bit of gathering. You can see the waistline, um, but not at all like what we have seen in past decades. They're also quite thin. This dress on the left in particular is transparent. She would need to wear a slip underneath this so that we didn't see all of her like a merveilleuse, right? And the one on the right, um, I think you can maybe see a little outline of a slip um, on the dress form, um, but it's, it's also semi-transparent as well. So very, very light. And you can see these sweet little details with the insertion lace here on the right, the lace on her collar. We've got some holdover maybe from the Art Nouveau with these floral embroidery details um, on the left. But if those examples were what the everyday woman was wearing, high fashion, of course, is continuing to really push the envelope and just go full out into amazingness. You can see um, these are images from the magazine, the Gazette de Bonton. Um, they are showcasing designs by the House of Worth, but the fashion illustrator, the one who's doing the drawings, is not the dress designer, it's uh, Georges Barbier who's doing these illustrations. And so the fashion illustrator becomes kind of a, a mover and shaker of fashion as well as designers. So kind of carrying on where Charles Dana Gibson um, and another artist, Mucha from, from the um, Art Nouveau era kind of left off. And you can see these bright, bold color combinations, these kind of dramatic, exotic touches that are included here. Check out the hairstyle that's changed. We'll be speaking to that in a moment. Um, and, you know, kind of beautiful, luxurious fabrics and accessories. And, oh, the gorgeous shoes. So here are some evening dresses from the early 20s. These are designers. The one on the left is from Calisseur. Um, one in the middle is a long vin, and the one on the right is worth, all from the first years of the 1920s. Um, you can see just luxurious fabric, the silk, the sequins, the embroidery, the velvet, um, the beading, um, the kind of just gauzy chiffon um, that's just kind of like whispering around the body. And you can see again this interest in the exotic by those design motifs on the right there. Um, and um, some of these, these kind of shapes and colors that we've got going on. So after centuries of corsetry, that hourglass figure is out of fashion and the woman's body has become kind of a rectangle. She, there is no discernible difference between the bust line, the waistline and the hip line. And you can see bare arms, bare legs, bare shoulders, well, legs encased in hose, but but um, exposed legs, bare arms, um, you know, a decolletage neckline, right? Exposed um, neck and shoulders. And especially with this one here on the right, right? We're really interested back to basics, back to draping fabric in interesting ways, but small amounts of fabric, as I was saying, you can see this dress here on the right. It's almost like we're back to the Greek keton again. So there's a lot of freedom of movement in these. You can see these dresses kind of want to dance. They want to move and the body can move so freely in them um, because there's, there's no kind of carapace that we've been used to seeing for the last while. I did want to draw your attention though to kind of an alternative 20 silhouette for women's evening wear. These are three different images, right? Two existing dresses and one fashion illustration by Barbier. These two um, gowns are uh, couture, um, but one is from the early 20s and one is from the mid 20s. Um, and the Barbier illustration is from the very early 20s as well. This dress is called the Robe de Steel. And as you can see, it is, much fuller in the skirt. It's kind of a throwback to that crinoline look from the mid 19th century, but of course with a modern take on it. And um, so a robe to steel needs 
some sort of petticoat or crinoline underneath it to hold that volume of the skirt out. You can see it quite stylized in the Barbier illustration, a little bit less um, severe in these actual garments, right? But still, right, pulling away from the body and kind of floating about her. But you can see the top part of the gown is very similar to those evening dresses that I just showed you in the last slide, where they are, you know, kind of body skimming, kind of relatively untailored, relatively smooth, and kind of floaty and flowy without, um, you know, heavy tailoring around the body. So by mid-decade, you can see that hemline does creep up, but look at where it is. This is day wear. Um, these, these are women photographed in Paris. Um, and that hemline is below the kneecap, right? So we can see bare calf, bare shin. We can see all the ankle we want, and we can see their fabulous shoes. Um, but really, just to the knee is what it is. That rectilinear boxy shape is still going. You can see the waistline has dropped so that those sashes and belts and um, jacket lines are kind of resting along the top of the hip bone. Their hair has gotten cut short and they're wearing these fabulous hats that we'll talk about some more in a few minutes called cloches. So this is really kind of the iconic look of the 20s right here. But check out the detail on their dresses. They've got pleats, they've got layers of flounces, um, they've got some details on collars. They dress it up with these necklaces. Um, you can see that jacket that's paired to go with the skirt. Um, so lots of variation within this one style. As I've said in recent lectures, that the late 19th century and definitely the early 20th century is kind of the rise of the couture designer. Um, and we'll talk about several as we go forward in these next few lectures. Of course, you can't really talk about the 20s without mentioning Coco Chanel. I find her a very problematic figure, but her influence on fashion is undeniable. So here is her iconic garçon look on the left-hand side, day wear, blouse and skirt and cardigan and cloche hat. And then she was also kind of um, the originator of the little black dress for evening wear. And so here's a Chanel sketch for her little black dress that appeared in American Vogue magazine in 1926. So that word garçon is French for boy. Um, now this word garçon, it's French for a boy, it has to do with the 1920s feminine um, stylish silhouette and ensemble kind of appearing uh, what we would call today a little gender fluid, certainly a, a far departure from 19th century ideas about feminine attire and uh, presentation. Um, certainly plenty has been written about, you know, is this um, a psychological response to the huge loss of young men from World War I? Is it just a natural trend that fashion was following all along? Is it something else? I will leave it to you to decide, and I bet several of you that are working on the 20s for your papers have come across something to say about this as well. If you remember last time, I was showing you how Art Nouveau motifs and patterns like the whiplash curve were appearing in clothing as they were in architecture. You can see that here too, kind of art deco geometrics um, and other design motifs that we'll see in architecture and decor are also appearing on clothes. So here are some Parisians around 1926 in a Chanel suit on the left-hand side and then in dresses on the right-hand side and there is a very deco feel to them. Certainly the 1920s were continuing this trend of high fashion being quickly reproduced and copied kind of down the economic scale for middle class women and working class women and women who could make things at home. So here is a page from um, a Sears and Roebuck catalog, um, 1926, showing you day dresses and suits for women. And on the left hand side, you have a French um, kind of couture outfit, a, a dress with a match and coat. Um, which is probably silk and wool. And then on the right, you have a rayon, which is um, imitation silk um, in this floral pattern 
day dress. So you can have fashion no matter what your income is. And the 20s definitely continued the trend of women copying stylish looks at home um, by, by printing patterns or drafting patterns and cutting material out and sewing it together themselves. So this idea of this one hour dress was kind of all the rage in the 1920s because there was little material and the shapes were relatively simple, certainly compared to, you know, what we were looking at at the 1880s um, and even, you know, the early 1900s. It's so much easier to cut these basic shapes and sew them together, even with like these little flounced godets um, and this kind of cut out V line on this neck. Um, you can see we're kind of back to those basic shapes where, where we're wasting very little fabric to get done what we need to do to make something stylish. I had mentioned a few slides earlier that Chanel has been credited with inventing the little black dress. She certainly wasn't the only one to market it, as you can see from these dresses here from the mid 1920s. These are all Parisian designers. We've, we've got the Calosseur, Poiret, and Viennet all giving us their version of the little black dress. Now you can see the, the caption here says, little black dress for cocktail hour. Now I'm hoping you remember from a few lectures ago where I talked about the tea gown, right? That kind of loosely structured loungewear outfit that women would wear in the late afternoon in between their daytime activities and getting dressed for the dinner hour when they often had more formal engagements again, right? And the tea gown was this kind of unstructured, dress or dress and robe combination that she could wear with her corset loosened or removed to kind of take a break from all of the strictures of of being fashionably dressed. By the 1920s, certainly among young women, the concept of the tea gown has really disappeared and been replaced by the cocktail dress. Not surprisingly, right, because there's no more corset to relax from between afternoon and evening. And remember, more young women are working and working in like offices and stores and kind of um, white collar jobs. And they needed a quick change from working to evening attire. And so um, this cocktail dress kind of becomes the answer. It starts out as the day dress silhouette in evening fabrics. And this kind of coincides with a, a kind of relaxing of those Victorian ideas of what to do in the evening and formal evening um, events that instead of formal balls, people tend to be drinking and dancing at clubs in a more informal setting. So the tea gown is out, the cocktail dress is in, it is often a little black dress. Um, and this is true even though especially in America where it is technically illegal to purchase and consume alcohol. Of course, there was plenty of evening attire that wasn't black, as you can see by these designer examples here. And notice how these dresses shimmer and they are kind of designed um, to, to kind of dance, right? There's lots of pieces and, and edges and, and um, shapes on them that move when the body is in motion. This is a decade all about dancing. And where in the 1890s and early 1900s, we had that Gibson girl as kind of the it girl of fashion, she gets replaced by the 20s flapper. Again, lots of reasons why she's called a flapper, lots of theories anyway. Um, but the flapper is this idea of a youthful, vigorous, independent young woman. She might be going to college. Um, she's certainly socially um, kind of sophisticated and is definitely ready to have some fun. You can see here um, that that image on the right hand side is a cover of Life magazine. It's a girl graduating college. She's got her cigarette. She's got her cocktail. She's got her flapper dress on. Upper left hand corner, an unknown woman um, in a cocktail dress around mid decade. And look what she's got tucked into her stocking garter. It is a flask with illegal prohibited alcohol. And in the middle, we have, uh, you know, half a dozen college girls from uh, Howard University. And you can see how they're all kind of typifying this glamorous, um, youthful, sporty, like to have fun kind of sensibility. 
So I've included several pictures of young women in the period dancing or dressed to be ready for dancing. And as you can see, all of these dresses are below the knee. They don't have that kind of string fringe all over them. Um, and they're not skin tight and super short, right? You can see that these dresses have some body built into them below the waist. Um, you know, like these dresses on the bottom right hand corner, which are evening dresses from 1927, there, there is definitely volume in that skirt, but it's just out of such light fluttery material and it's seamed into that dropped waist that it hangs straight until the dancer is ready to move. Um, and you can see that in the top left-hand corner, her fluttery skirt, how, how it has some volume when she kicks her legs out. So um, the image that we're used to of the flapper is really an image from like 1950s movies like Singing in the Rain or 1970s version of The Great Gatsby. Or like I said, in the 2000s when we kind of made everything out of uh, stretch lace and sequins. Um, but the actual flappers were dancing in some very lovely crafted outfits. And as we move on towards the end of the decade, here are some examples of day wear that dropped waist really continues. So you can see for day wear, it's usually going to be a blouse and a skirt, maybe paired with a sweater or a jacket or a dress. Um, and you can see these are probably summer wear mostly on the left and then towards fall, possibly winter on the right um, as the body gets more covered up, right? On the left hand side, they're sleeveless. Um, but again, that dropped waist continues. You can see the belt at the natural waistline, but the waistline of the garment is several inches below that. You can see the pleated skirt happening there, um, particularly the third drawing to the right. And um, you can see just a variety of prints and um, kind of contrasting fabrics and some florals, some stripes, some geometrics in there. Lots and lots and lots of cool stuff. I wanted to show you some examples of um, the strands of pearls or beads, right? These are called lavaliers that 1920s women often wore with their outfits. As you could see, they could be one long strand that dangles down past the waistline, or you could uh, loop several strands of them around your neck to make this multi-strand layer effect. Um, Real pearls were, of course, very, very expensive, and strands this long would have been prohibitively expensive for almost every woman who walked this earth. Um, but for that lucky one percenter woman, it's, they might have been actual pearls. If you couldn't afford real pearls, glass beads would do fine. And the final years of the decade for evening wear, you can see um, some more variation in style as we're going towards the end of the decade. Instead of staying right below the knee, that hemline is dipping low again, but it's kind of doing that high-low asymmetrical look. Um, you can see we're playing with asymmetry in the bodice as well. You can see we're playing with asymmetry at the um, waistline or the dropped waistline in this case. Um, and again, that kind of like handkerchief pleating, we're turning fabrics on the diagonal to get more volume into um, uh, and more flow into a smaller amount of fabric. Um, and just really um, playing around with what the fabric is capable of doing. In some ways, these dresses feel a little bit more grown up or maturely sophisticated than some of the earlier uh, dresses from earlier in the decade. For outerwear, a coat that went to at least the hemline of your dress or slightly below it was a good idea. You can see that these coats are all fairly rectangular, column-like um, in their shapes with uh, fairly, you know, close sleeves, not super tight, but, you know, not super bulky sleeves either. Fur, as you can see, is a very, very popular uh, material to have on your coat, either a full coat made of fur or a cloth coat trimmed with fur, if you could manage it. And look at that gorgeous um, kind of jacquard art deco styling on this um, vintage coat in the middle. Now, of course, a lot of women couldn't 
afford fur or didn't have access to fur. So lots of women wore cloth coats as well and coats made out of wool um, were certainly um, regular items in a woman's wardrobe. But check these out. These are faux fur coats. They are um, woolen coats that have been um, woven to imitate the stripes that you see naturally occurring in fur. And look at how they've played with horizontal and vertical stripes um, on that lady on the left. Um, look at how they're playing with um, the scale of the stripes against the body and look at how they're playing with how the coat um, closes. It tends to wrap across the front and, and close asymmetrically with just a few buttons. Other than that, the shape is the same. You can see kind of like that continued dropped waist, that broad um, shawl collar, the um, kind of relaxed sleeves with wide cuffs or faux cuffs on them. And again, um, you know, below the skirt length in most cases. Wanted to show some shoe love here in this decade. Shoes were always visible because the hemline has shortened so considerably. Um, and that kind of Victorian boot has, has given way to a pump, usually two inches or two and a half inches heel. Um, you can see that heel has a little bit of curve to it, but it's, it's not a stiletto. It's got some oomph to it so that you aren't going to um, slip and slide on the pavement. Rounded toes, often straps across the top of the foot or down the length of the foot, right, called the T-strap. And they were often highly decorative, like these two-toned pumps, um, or they would have little flourishes on them, cut work in the leather, um, fancy buckles or buttons on them, and pretty colors. I didn't include many pictures of shoes on this slide because you can go back and look at all of the gorgeous footwear in the other slides if you so choose. As for hats, there was really only one style of hat that really defined this decade, the cloche. Cloche is the French word for bell. And as you can see, um, it's a close fitting kind of bell shaped rounded hat that sits and fully covers the head. And then from there, you can have a wide variety of brims. Most of the time, um, they were kind of narrow brimmed or the brim was turned up so that the face was fully visible. But as you can see by this example on the left, the brim might turn out a little bit, um, kind of framing the face. And again, they could be lots of different fabrics. They could be uh, decorated in different ways. They would be trimmed in many different ways and just endlessly gorgeous. The reason why the cloche hat was such a persistent hallmark of style in this decade and then on into the 30s a little bit um, is because of the changing in women's hairstyles, the bob. Um, women started to cut their hair in the late teens. Um, uh, an actress, Irene Castle, had her hair bobbed short and it, it caught on pretty quickly. But really, the 20s is the decade of the bobbed hair. Think of how many centuries women have had long, long, long hair, except for that brief moment after the French Revolution when they did that à la victime short kind of pixie cut. Here we are again. But of course, there's no one way to bob your hair. There are lots of different ways to do it. And so here are some examples. Um, the lady in the bottom right-hand corner um, is, uh, I don't know her name, um, she's this regular woman, um, and she's wearing what's called an earphone faux bob. If you look, you can see her long hair has been kind of braided, coiled, twisted up, and then pinned in place around her ears to imitate these shorter styles um, that you can see on this whole page. Um, and you can see for stray hair, wavy hair, curly hair, some of them are quite close to the head, some of them are very full. Um, the woman in the bottom left, Miss Catherine Dunham, she's got what's called our finger waves. Um, and that was done with special curling irons and some pomade like brillantine to kind of hold them in place. Um, top right hand corner is uh, Anna Mae Wong, and she's got a, um, what, a variation on what was called the Dutch Bob. But as you can see, lots and lots and lots of choices. Woman in the top left-hand corner, uh, unknown woman, the style she's got is a shingle because it's kind of full on the sides and then at the nape of the neck, it's really kind of tapered down to, to almost nothing. But look at, she's got a bobby pin 
kind of holding that lock of hair back um, from the side of her face. Bobby pins are an invention of this decade as well. I'm guessing the bob and the bobby pin kind of go hand in hand. But as you can see, this hairstyle was made for the cloche. The cloche was made for this hairstyle. If you had a lot a mass of coily hair that you're trying to deal with, you're not going to be able to tuck it up inside that really close fitting hat. So there we are. Which is not to say that women only wore cloches. There are a few other styles as well. For example, the bandeau, which is this wide um, you know, strip of fabric or uh, stiffened decorated fabric, like you can see the lady at the top left that's studded with rhinestones. Um, but they could just be as simple as a, as a kind of silky band around the head. They tended to sit low over the forehead um, and kind of cover um, the forehead and the bangs. Um, they were sometimes known as headache bands because I'm sure they were uncomfortable if you wore them for a long period of time. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of a turban as well, right? So just wrapping your whole head up in beautiful fabric. I wanted to take a minute to discuss makeup because for the first time in about a century, women were uh, kind of consciously choosing to wear obvious makeup. We've had this whole century of, of so-called natural beauty where women probably were applying subtle cosmetics to their faces um, to achieve a, you know, I just woke up like this kind of healthy look. But here in the 1920s, women are overtly wearing makeup and, and choosing to look made up. So a few things for this decade, focus was really on the eyes and the lips. People did, women did put rouge or blush on their cheeks, but really it's all about dramatic eyes and dramatic mouths. So you can see here from this photo. Um, and with lips, women were drawing um, kind of unnatural shape to their lips, really, um, accentuating the curve of the upper lip and then the kind of rounded curve on the bottom lip. So that double arch on the top and then the rounded on the bottom. So this is called a Cupid's bow or sometimes they're called bee stung lips. So that, so that the lip line was fuller right in the center under the nose and then very, very slender to kind of disappearing out towards the um, center of the eye where the corner of the mouth is. You can see that in that fashion illustration um, where there's a self-shaping lipstick that's there to kind of help make that happen. And you can see that in the photo. Another thing that was new to this decade for a long time was coloring the nails. Now, women all over the world have colored their nails uh, for millennia using henna and things like that. But now women are using lacquer, right? Nail polish like we still use today. So... Um, one thing that's going on in this decade is that um, there are makeup manufacturers and makeup sellers and they're being sold in department stores. Um, and so women are buying um, makeup supplies. It may be that the film industry really started this trend because of course the 1920s um, is, is when um, Film really started to take off because we were able to add sound to the moving picture. Film had been around for a decade or two before, but now we've got incorporated sound. Film is still in black and white. When you're shooting in black and white, you really have to up the contrast between light and dark areas um, on a person, on a body, um, in a scene, right, to, to make um, that kind of monochromatic um, color scheme work. And so with film, Dark, dramatic eyes really showed up contrast. Dark, dramatic lips in a pale face really punched the contrast. Um, dark hair that frames the face in an interesting way is a big contrast. So it's a little unclear how heavily made up actual women were out in the world living their lives versus women on screen or in black and white photos where you kind of had to punch it up if you know what I mean. But life imitates art, which imitates life, which imitates art. And so it becomes a chicken and egg kind of question. So here are some screen sirens, Dada Barra, Clara Bow, Pola Negri, and they're all showing you this very heavily made up look. Um, 
this is also sometimes called the vamp look, that really heavily done smoky eye where there's eyeliner, you know, really smudgy underneath the lower lid, really super dark lips. Um, um, hair accessories or hats or headdresses pulled way down low over that brow so that you cannot, you can, you can barely even see eyebrows, right? Um, the vamp is kind of the, the, older, more jaded sister to the flapper in terms of fashion sensibility. Um, some women did wear it. Again, remember though, these are black and white photos for film. Um, and so this may be playing up to a little more extreme than was actually done in real life. And one more important note about cosmetics and hair products in this decade for women. Madam C.J. Walker um, was a makeup and hair product entrepreneur, designer, um, and she was designing products specifically for women of color. Textured hair requires different products to stay healthy and strong. Um, and, you know, here we are 50, 60 years after the official end of enslavement, women of color were a consumer class and they were often ignored by the main market. Of course, there's still a lot of segregation going on um, and women of color were not always allowed into the spaces where cosmetics were being sold. Madam CJ Walker saw a client base, saw a need, um, developed a line of products, um, became very, very wealthy and developed a huge following. Um, I'm showing you here a, an unknown woman with, with finger waves, um, who's probably using Madam C.J. Walker's products. And then um, up at the top there, a photo of Miss Josephine Baker. And you can see her hair has kind of been lacquered down and she has these kind of little spit curls. And then she's got some very obvious makeup on her face as well. Um, she used her own um, formula um, and, and promoted her own line as well of, of hair um, lacquer, basically. Um, but you can see for the first time uh, a, an idea that, oh, women of color have money to spend and deserve beauty products. We should probably give a little bit of attention to the men in this decade. As we start the decade, that sack suit, three-piece suit, pants, Jacket, vest is the preferred look for business attire and for non-formal day wear, right? Those old Victorian rules about formal day wear continue through here, but formal day wear becomes a less uh, common occurrence. Um, so you can see here, right, natural shoulder line, that kind of defined waist that's a little bit high, a slim cut, um, notched lapels on those jackets, um, Dress shirts have turned down uh, pointed collars. Pants are fairly loose and fairly um, wide at the ankle. You can see on the left-hand side, these are guys golfing, right? The guy on the right is wearing a fedora. The guy on the left is wearing that soft cap. Guy on the right is dressed more for business than for golf, but the look persists. As the decade moves on, that kind of nipped in waist look starts to relax a little bit. These are some images from um, closer to the latter half of the decade. Two unknown men in Harlem. You can see the fedora on the right and um, the man on the left is wearing a straw boater. Beautiful three-piece suits. You can see that kind of baggy trouser, the cuff um, at the hem, really shiny shoes some narrow ties, right? But all three pieces of that suit are the same color and fabric. On the right-hand side, we have uh, a group of young men from 1927 from Yale, the Yale Whiffenpoofs, um, the acapella group. Again, you can see here, right? The suits are three-piece matching. They've got ties that are kind of the only pop of color. One guy there's got a watch chain. Um, and check out their not shiny shoes. Oh, well. For sport, we have these pants called plus fours. As you can see, they're kind of an exaggerated form of the knickerbockers that we've seen uh, in earlier decades. Um, and then we have something called Oxford bags on the right, which are men's dress pants that have just gotten super wide. 
um, you can see the, the really wide cuff at the bottom there. Those could measure, you know, like two to two and a half times a quote normal pair of pants would be around the bottom. And the kind of urban legend that goes with this is because Oxford students really love to play golf, um, but the dons of Oxford said you couldn't wear knickerbockers in the classroom. So they wore wide-legged trousers over their knickerbockers to save them time getting to the golf course. Um, plus fours, they're called plus fours because the idea is that the, the pants kind of extend four inches down past the knee, then turn back up and get caught in that cuff right below the kneecap. So four inches plus. Um, past the knee. There are also plus sixes and plus eights. I don't know if this story is true about the Oxford bags being worn over plus fours. If you look at these plus fours, they are super baggy. I don't think these Oxford bags on the right hand side could really conceal those, but it's kind of a fun urban legend. You can see, though, even though they're golfing, they've got their vest and their shirt on. Well, they're not golfing. They're walking down a city street, but dressed as if they were about to go golfing. Another look for that is with this sweater. You can see as the waistline of the pants is kind of high, that means the sweater is gonna be a little bit short. And then here's some sportswear, both men and women. Um, you can see these pants are cut a little bit more narrow, but check out these jackets. <laughs> so while well, the suit was all three pieces matching, there was also developing for casual occasions like sport or lounging around is the sport coat where it's got the same silhouette as a sack coat, but it's going to be kind of more flamboyantly colored um, and it's going to be a contrasting fabric, often paired with white flannel trousers, as you see here. Evening attire for men continues along as we have seen. Um, you can see the tailcoat for the formal occasions, tuxedos for slightly less. Tuxedos can be single or double breasted. Um, again, black tie versus white tie. White tie with tails, never black tie with tails. So you can see the gentleman here on the white in on the right have white tails, and the one gentleman in this fashion illustration has the white tie. The other two in their tuxedos or their dinner jackets are in black tie. Trench coats and wool overcoats, of course, continue on. I'm showing you a fashion fad here, raccoon fur coats. It was a fad among college men. This one is a coat that was uh, worn to a Yale's graduation in 1926. Um, why raccoon fur? I'm guessing because <laughs> raccoons were plentiful and annoying, and so their fur was inexpensive. And a little bit about men's hairstyles. Hair can be parted on the center, but most often it was parted on the side, fairly long on the top, fairly short on the sides and to the back, and oftentimes slicked back or um, kind of gelled over with uh, formulations like brillantine um, or other kind of like hair oil or hair tonic. You can see how shiny their hair is here. Lots of men were continuing along with a clean shaven look, or you could see very thin mustaches like we have um, Duke Ellington there um, on the top and on the bottom, uh, uh, and actress Ronald Coleman, that kind of pencil thin mustache barely there. Um, bottom left is um, a photo of a young Langston Hughes poet, among many other things, and he's got that um, natural curl to his hair, so he's just kind of ordered it with some oil um, and um, kind of that Marcel wave like we were seeing in some of the women's styles is also a style for men.